If you have got a Bible, you'll want to open that to 2 Peter chapter 2. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and Usher would love to put a, one in your hand so that you could follow along with us. We are making our way through 2 Peter, the epistle of 2 Peter, and we are now starting chapter 2. Uh, the title of the message is False Teachers Part 1. So for the next few weeks, uh, we're going to be looking at the idea of false prophecy and false teachers in the church and, and in the world today. Um, so this is, this is really important stuff. Like I'd said, uh, Peter, uh, you know, he's in a Roman prison cell. He's pinning this. He, he's days or weeks possibly from, from being martyred for his faith. And, and so we could say these are the words of a dying man. And to the church, to the bride of Christ, and, and out of all the warnings that here in this second epistle he writes, out of all the warnings, this, he's, he's focusing primarily on the fact that there's false teachers or wolves among you. Now, this is not something that he just came up with on his own. You see, the presence of false teachers or false prophets is spoken of throughout all of Scripture. They were in the Old Testament, and uh, so it, it's, not, it's not something new. In fact, Jesus here in Matthew 7, 13, picking up in 13, I wanted to read this section of Scripture to you in opening. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because, you see, narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. And then Jesus says, his next words, Beware of false prophets, right there, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. He says in 16, You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes? from thorn bushes or figs, from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. You see, 18 says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. The tree's bad or the tree's good. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Speaking of judgment. Therefore, in 20, therefore, by their fruits... You will know them. Many are led astray. But in, regarding the, uh, in regards to the end times, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 24, picking up in verse 10. This is interesting. It says, And many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. He's speaking of the last days. And in our society, so many people are so offended. They're even offended by words of truth, words of love and light. But offensiveness, everybody's on the offensive and defensive. It's always, you see, there's this struggle going on. This is important. And he says, and they'll betray one another and hate one another. Verse 11, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness, right, will abound, and the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, those are the words of Jesus, but even Paul in Acts 20, he did some serious warning as well. Acts 20, 26, he says this. <clears throat> and this is really important. L listen to Paul. This is his testimony. This is what he's testifying of. He says, therefore, Acts 20, 26, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. How could this apostle be innocent of the blood of all men? He'll tell you. Wow. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel. Therefore, he says, 
Take heed to yourselves and to the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers and shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. This is a call to spiritual leaders. And every one of us, leadership is influence. And every one of us has some form of influence. Whether it's a pastor or a leader in the church, or, or you're, you're a father of a family or a, a wife that are raising young children. We've got influence and it matters. Let me read this again. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, all those that you're influencing, among, influencing, among which the Holy Spirit, this is his job, has made you overseers and shepherd of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, Paul saying, savage wolves, like ravages wolves, like Jesus said, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples or followers after themselves. Ah, they're wondering, follow me. But what would Paul say later? Follow, follow me as I follow Christ, right? Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I didn't cease to warn everyone day and night with tears. And so now, brethren, I commend you to God, he says, and to the word of God, the word of, of, of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And then in 33, he says, and I haven't coveted anyone's silver, gold, or apparel. You know, our passage this morning is going to mark the false teacher or the false prophet as one who is, who is rooted in covetousness, he, he, of greediness. And this, he, he's, this is my testimony. I, I haven't wanted anything from you but to give you the truth. That's pretty powerful testimony. And so in our passage this morning, here in 2 Peter 2, is a strong warning from the apostle to guard against corruption. Again, not from without, but from within. You see, there's going to be some questions answered. Questions like these three. What kind of person would do such a thing? <laughs> Secondly, how do we stay clear from these kind of teachers? And thirdly, what is it? What is it that some are led away by these lies? You know, nothing bothers a pastor or someone who speaks the truth. It wounds us, it hurts us. When you see someone who has sat in your church for four or five years and, and has heard your sermons and write for the words right out of Scripture, and then you see or you hear of them running off and going to some foolish conference or, or something, they're just being led away by some false teaching, and you're going, oh, what is wrong? How could they chase after that? When, when they've heard nothing but the truth, and we're reading Scripture week in and week out. And they're running after something that, that just is just scratching their ears. Christian, the idea is that if you and I remain in this, we don't get itchy ears. This satisfies the itch. Right? People that run after that stuff, they, they're not in this. And if they were in this, they would recognize the falseness of that. You know, my daughter's living with us until April because she's getting married April 5th. And she brought with her a cat. Now, I mean, I, I kind of like an animal-free home at this stage of our life, but I'm also a cat person. And I do. I have a way with cats. I do, right? Because you know, I'm in my office, and the cat jumps on the lap, and I just, oh, in the ears. And that cat loves me. They're so jealous. That cat digs me, man. <laughs> because I know how to itch those ears. Oh, man, she's just like, just mooing Oh, She's all over the place, you know. She's like, just, oh, she just loves it. But that's, that's what these false teachers do. Right? They just, they're just itching those ears. But in all of these questions that we're gonna, we have in our hearts and our minds after reading the passage, the simple answer is this for all of us. Evil exists, <laughs> and evil doesn't take a break. It exists, 
and it doesn't take a break. Let's read our passage. 2 Peter chapter 2, picking up in verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment <clears throat> and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man, speaking of Lot, dwelling among them, he tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows, so this is the conclusion, nine, then the Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation and to reserve the ungodly under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lusts of uncleanliness and despising authority. They are presumptuous, they are self-willed, they are not afraid to speak ill of dignitaries, whereas angels, he's speaking of true angels, who are greater in power and might, do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Now, all that is said, let's look back at the last two verses of chapter 1 that bridges the gap. He says, now knowing this first, now I've got to make these truthful statements first before you can really absorb the rest of what I'm about to say. So knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. You see, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That is an essential truth to the child of God, to understand that prophecy is not of any private interpretation. I told you God wants you and I to think for ourselves, but he wants us to think biblically. And you see, we have the Holy Spirit inspired and given to us. That is his job, to rightly divide the word of truth, to lead you into all truth. You can pray, you can open your scriptures and know that God, through his word and through the spirit, will speak to you just as he speaks to me. And he speaks to me just as he speaks to, you know, this other great pastor, right? Or this other great person. We can have confidence in the power and the authority and the purposes of God, not in man. That's the purpose of those passages, we're trusting the Lord. We're not turning to man. We're trusting in him. God is greater. But it says here, but, they were, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Peter's reminding us that even among the true prophets in the Old Testament, there were those false prophets, like Balaam, who had to be corrected by a donkey, that turned around and spoke to him and said, what are you doing, man? You see, he's reminding us of the past. And just as these holy men spoke truth and they were directed by the Spirit of God, so too the apostles who wrote Scripture now are directed by truth. Old Testament, we have Old Testament prophets speaking forth the oracles of God, by, guided by the, the power of God. <clears throat> Then we have four Gospels, four Gospels, right? Written by disciples, later apostles, who, who, who were right there, eyewitnesses of the miracles of Jesus, <clears throat> of the healings and, and all the miracles, of the sermons of Jesus. Not only that, but the death and resurrection of Christ. 
And so it's their testimony, the gospel, the life of Jesus Christ. And then we have epistles. These, po- these apostles later wrote epistles to the churches inspired by the Holy Spirit. We don't have apostles like this today. If you think so, you're biblical and you're wrong. You see, because we have all the prophecy. Okay? We have pastors, we have teachers that rightly divide the word of truth. That's what our call to do is. But we don't have old, or excuse me, this New Testament type of apostles today. If one claims to be, I would be very leery, extremely, extraordinary leery of that. Because there's only one person, one reason why he would want to call himself an apostle. And that's because he's wanting to add to the scriptures. He wants to have the same authority as those who wrote them. Right? That's dangerous. I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where to get the bread. Right? Just a teacher of the scriptures. And so, you have false prophets among you. This is important. There will always be false teachers among us. They will always be inspired by their own imagination and their own perversion, as scriptures have said. And if this is the case, and it was the case in the past, then we can bet that there will be false teachers and people bringing forth false truth today. Peter is stating this more as a fact than a possibility. There will be false teachers among you. And not just from the outside, right? But from the inside, the church, inside the faith, a.k.a. the body of Christ, among you. And this is what's sad. It's secretly. It says, secretly they'll bring in their destructive heresies. False teachers work secretly. How? How? You see, the deceptive nature of a, of a false teacher is, is the fact that he's hiding the truth. And it's simple. I never just tell a straight-out lie, even with my dad. When little Roger got busted, I always wrapped the lie in some kind of truth. I've got to make it believable, right? I've got to make it believable. I never I was horrible at it. My dad could read a liar a mile away, which meant I got the belt most of the time, which caused me not to be a liar, that worked. We should whip our kids more. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> whip them and they won't be liars. I'm sorry. That's not in the Bible. Well, you maybe spoil the rods, right? Spare the rods, spoil the child. Okay, it is in the Bible. There you go. All right. Woof. <laughs> That's so awesome. Okay, so back to the word. It's secret, right? No false teacher ever announces himself as a false teacher, right? In most cases, what's sad is they've been deceived somewhere down the line. They fell captive to some kind of deception. And it tells us how we can pray for them. But listen, the greatest way to deceive a person is to add some truth again to that lie to that false doctrine. There's got to be an element of truth in order to make it believable, but they always do that in secret. Let me give you an analogy. Now, to this morning, picture me, me, good Pastor Roger, handing out brownies to everybody, delicious-looking, warm brownies. You know, I like warm brownies with nuts, if you ever make me brownies. I like brownies with nuts. And after you ate the brownies, I informed you well, that I mischievously, secretly put a little dog poop in it and I mixed it up and you're already grossed out right now wouldn't you feel deceived I mean I would be upset I would feel deceived but secretly you see I had added something unhealthy it's one thing to deceive another and possibly affect their health and it's another to deceive another's faith and possibly affect their eternal future. Do you understand the, the gravity of this? That's, 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 that's a horrible thing. You, you would be upset with me if I did that. Now this reminds us, listen, heresy is not harmless. Do you get it? 
It's not harmless. You think, oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to just listen like eating the brownie. Man, you took the brownie, you smelled it. You know, you think, well, I didn't, it didn't taste like poop. It didn't smell like poop. You know? And so you'd be okay. You ate it once. But if I kept giving that to you on a regular basis, eventually it's going to affect your health. And a lot of us as children of God, we've got to be careful what we hear. Right? Like the children's song. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Because the Father up above is looking down on us. And I don't know the rest of the song. <laughs> we used to sing it to the kids, but my kids are all grown up, so I don't sing it anymore. But, but you see? You see the, the thing? Heresy is not harmless. And he says here, it's destructive heresy. The most destructive heresy are those who, who change the doctrine of Jesus Christ. They change who he is. A Jehovah's Witness will come knocking on their door or your door with a smile. They're wonderful people. But they'll tell you, Jesus died on the cross for your sin. And you might say, well, yippee-yay, come on in, let's have a cup of coffee. And then you're going to, if you're listening, their Jesus and your Jesus are not the same Jesus. You see, Jesus is not God. There's no, he's, he's the first creation of God, he's created by God. He's not God. You know what that means? That means that any good old boy could have died for the sins of humanity. I'm a good guy, I'm a great guy. Ask my wife. She thinks I'm super great. But if I started standing up here and saying, you know what? I'm going to give my life for the sins of humanity. You're going to go, you're an idiot. Jesus had to be God in the flesh to die for the sins of all humanity. You see, it's changed. Remember, all false doctrine, all false truth has an element of truth. They'll come off as light. Even Satan will come in, Right? In light. I've seen the light. What? Oh, who is he? Have you seen the light? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The light of the world. There's a big difference. We'll talk some more about this. But one of the most destructive heresies is who is Jesus? Not to mention those doctrines or those teachings that are unbiblical or unbiblically influence the work of that Jesus has had on us and in us. Galatians 5, 19. Dear Paul, he's speaking. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Listen, listen. They are adult, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentiousness, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish, selfish ambition, content, uh, dissensions, heresies, 21, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the likes of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the times past, that those who practice, practice. Such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The idea, you know, we're all guilty. But when I come to Christ, I practice truth. I'm a lover of truth. Right? You know, you know a righteous man falls and he gets back up. Right? By the grace of God, there's no one perfect. But, but, but we're not practicing these things. And we're not practicing heresies. Right? We're, we're practicing any more than we're practicing murders, right? We don't want to, that doesn't, we're not, our life is not marked by these things. Even denying the Lord who bought them. You see, false teachers deny the Lord who paid the price, he gave his own blood. And if they've done that, they've forgotten everything else. And they always say, you know, you need more. There's, there's got to be more. Acts 15, 5. Right? Acts 15, 5. Conflict over circumcision. Paul, Barnabas, show up in Jerusalem. Okay? 
What's happening is they, they were convicted. Okay, man, God has given us this gospel to take to the Gentiles, right? And so we've been taking it. And we've been seeing the Gentiles born again, filled with the Spirit of God, set free from paganism. I mean, it's, it's a revival. It's happening. But we're going to go down to Jerusalem, and we're going to talk to the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Now, the religious leaders in Jerusalem were made up of guys like Peter, but also some Judaizers that came to Christ but they were contaminating the issue. Listen, the issue was they wanted to lay some heavy revy on them. Okay, so B Paul, Barnabas, okay, okay. <clears throat> Tell you what, we're going we're gonna to see, we're going to consider what you're doing legitimate, but I think you need to add to the gospel, to the salvation of their souls, they need to be circumcised. Listen, 15.5. He just, what are you talking about? But some of the sect, and interestingly, in the Greek, that word sect means of the heresy. So listen, we can read it like this. But some of the heresies of the Pharisees, like a rapper up here, who believed rose up. So you got some Pharisees that were still hanging on to their old ways. They had believed, rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Oh, 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 woo! Paul went crazy. I'm saved by grace through faith, not of myself or the works of anyone, but, the, but of the blood of Christ. It's like, what are you talking about? If I did that, they would no longer be set free. He would just be lazing, placing more bondage on these people, right? I could just see Paul and Barnabas just losing their mind, right? False teaching can creep up, creep in anywhere even denying the very gospel and the work of Christ and the grace of God. Crazy. Galatians 2.4 says this, And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Listen to this quote. Even a person who has what appears to be a godly walk in relationship with Jesus Christ can still bring in destructive heresies. Sometimes good men who teach lies do the worst damage. Their lies are accepted far more easily because of their good character. Be careful. The enemy is swift. He says, bring into them this destructive destruction. It, it, it's swift destruction upon themselves. Those who are preaching false truth will not escape destruction. This word here is literally the death or, or hell. They're not going to escape it. Judgment is sure. And for some of us who have been hurt by these type of people, their judgment can't come fast enough. Chap verse 2, that was long verse 1. You guys are going to be here for like hours. Whew, I feel sorry for you already. <laughs> and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Listen, many follow. It's, listen, false teachers grow in popularity because it, it, it's of the flesh. It, it's attaching to the flesh. I've said, look, there are a million ways to draw a crowd that aren't godly, right? I mean, if this is just simply about drawing a crowd, and for most or for many, it just is about drawing a crowd. It's just about filling seats. Then I can just about say or do anything outside of the Word of God and make numbers grow. But remember, it's just something, right? Something has the appearance of, just because something has the appearance of success, and just because it, it might draw a big crowd, it doesn't mean it's God. You know, what's the saddest of all this? It's not that there are false teachers and prophets among us that are, right? It's that, that so many are led away. So many fall into the trap. That's, that's what's so sad. And it's one thing if, if some people have never heard the truth before. But how about those who have heard the truth? That's totally unnecessary. 
But maybe it's because they just go to church and they go home. And they go to church and they go home. And they never read their Bibles. And they never consider their faith. And they never ever seek the Lord for themselves. Jesus wants you to think for yourself. And it's the safest thing you can do. Is read your Bible and think for yourself. God has promised to give you a helper. Don't rely on me. That's dangerous. Don't rely on anybody. That's dangerous. Dangerous stuff. Because you see the way of truth will be blasphemed. This whole idea is that this means that God's holy name will be dishonored and disgraced. And I, for one, don't want to be any part of that. I don't want to have any part of that. Verse 3. But here's their strategy. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. You see, for a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Now, for me, I don't like to be exploited and I don't like to be deceived. And I definitely don't want to share in their judgment. I don't like that any more than you. I don't want to be exploited. I don't want to be used. I don't want to be a pawn in somebody's scheme, of get-rich scheme. Or in their heresies. By covetousness. Those who, who practice greediness. They're, the sign is they're, un, they're, 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 they're selfish. They're unsatisfied is what scripture is saying. And the ungodly are always marked by covetousness. Among other things like we read... Adultery, idolatry, murder, and covetousness. I mean, these, these, this is like the crowd you're in. These things are all fleshly. And their judgment has not been idle. Peter assures us that false teachers will be judged. Even though it seems like they prosper, their judgment is not idle. God's wrath will eventually pour out on them even if we see it as though he's allowing them to continue. All that's doing is heaping up more condemnation and causing their hearts to grow harder and harder. I don't expect false teachers to repent. May I, may I offend you? Hopefully I don't offend you, but I might offend somebody. I don't expect someone like Oral Roberts to turn from his ways. I do not. He's been doing it too long. That heart is hard as a stone. Right? That, that, there's just been too much, too much stuff said that's not biblical, not true, and not of Jesus. Okay? Boy, I don't like doing that. Rarely do I use somebody's name. But if the shoe fits, wear it. Right? Verse 4 through 6. For if God did not spare the angels, now he gives us these examples. Listen, and these are some pretty serious examples. And, and I want to say this, okay? You might question the whole, the whole fall, you know? I mean, really, this happened? You know, how, how did that, you know, a third of the angels were cast to the earth? Eh, okay. And then you might go, I, you know, the flood? I mean, did the flood really happen? You know, and then Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, did God really just, just, you know, rubble lashes? You know, did that really happen? Well, ironically, pay attention to the Bible. The Bible constantly, thousands of years after, still confirms these things to be true. It's still always going back and using these things as an example. We have, if you read the Bible from front to back, you have no reason to believe that these things did not really happen. They happened. Right? I mean, Peter's not questioning the legitimacy of any of these examples. He's actually using them as an illustration. That's, that's, that's powerful. That's powerful in the nature of God, in the scripture. I, I think that's just nutty. Okay? So, so listen, 
he, he, didn't, he didn't spare the angels who had sinned, but he cast them down to hell, delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and he did not spare the ancient world. He did not spare the ancient world, but he saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world, the world of ungodly, right? And then he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. Why would I want to live ungodly? I've got these examples saying that's not the way to go, right? So but let's, let's see. Let, listen, let me read you a little bit from Henry Haley's Bible handbook. And, and for every, I don't think I know a pastor that doesn't have this on his desk. It's a necessary resource for Bible study. But he says this, It's a sorry picture. Even within the apostolic generation, the world and the devil has succeeded in making heavy onslaught on the purity of the church. And then followed a long centuries of corruption. And even now, in our own enlightened age, in many sections or denominations of the church, the gospel of Christ in its original beauty Simplicity and purity is still buried and hid from the view by rubbish of forms and doctrines heaped upon the church through the ages by the world and the devil. It is a terrible sin to corrupt the church. Let those who do it take warning from what happened to the angels and what happened to those living in the time of Noah and to those living in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the point. Listen, if God did not spare the angels who sinned, now apparently, apparently, right, when a third of the angels were cast down or cast out of heaven and cast to the earth, right, there were some fallen angels who were cast directly out of that third, directly into bondage, okay? So this is the thing. Out of the third that were cast out of heaven, a big portion, and we don't know the number out of that third. We don't know the number of the third to begin with, right? But, but, but we don't know what number out of the third was actually cast directly into the pit of darkness and bound with chains. And then we have a portion of that third that is running and causing havoc with Satan, right? They're just Satan's servants, So, this is the thing. Praise God, we're not dealing with all third. You see, God is in control. He's not going to put you up against a battle you can't win. God will always keep the enemy at bay. I am protected. I'm protected as a child of God. A child of God cannot be demon-possessed. They can be oppressed, like Lot was. He brought torture upon himself by hanging out in Sodom and Gomorrah. That was his own stupid fault, being a righteous man. Listen, but as a child of God, God is always working in my favor. Stop blaming and giving power to Satan. He's powerless. Especially if you who are born again and filled with the Spirit of God and are called children of God. You can know more about. Read Hebrews 1. He, read Hebrews 2. Read Psalm 91, 11 and 12. You ask, well, what, what caused the fall? Why, why did these angels rise up against God, right? Well, you know, you know say it was pride. It was, it was, you know, covetousness. It was the same issue, right, of the heart. But the Bible teaches that, that angels and humanity are not created the same. That, that, that angels are created as higher beings at this present time than, than we are here. Okay? Higher beings. But they were created as higher beings to serve us under God's authority. Right? But in the grand scheme of things, when things are all wrapped up and we're in heaven, right? The angels will be under our authority. Is it possible 
the reason why this third and Satan himself rose up was because they said, no way. No way. We're created higher. I'm not going to serve the lesser. But all through Scripture, Jacob and Esau, right? The younger will serve the older, right? The, 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 if you want to find your life, you lose it. If you want to gain your life, right? You, you, it's like this backwards theology all through Scripture. I think that has a lot to do with what really happened there in heaven and what caused a third of these angels to rise up And caused them to sin. But they were cast down, it says. A portion of that third were delivered into chains of darkness. Their sinful pursuit for freedom put them in bondage. And it will do that to us as well. Your simple pursuit of freedom will lead you into bondage. Can, can I tell you one of the most powerful things in a Christian's life is submission and we hate it. We don't want to be submitted to one another, and we don't want to be submitted to God. Our, our flesh, it just hates it. Just like the third of those angels. Ugh, I want to cast it off. I don't want to submit. Guys, listen, in the flesh, your wife doesn't want to submit to you. Ooh, she hates it. She just hates the whole idea of it. <laughs> you know, your little kids were born sinners, and they don't want to submit either. They want to stomp their feet and say no. They're created that way. But when we become born again, when we become children of God, we're marked by submission. Submitting to God and submitting to one another in the fear of God. It's a powerful, powerful attribute for the children of God to be marked by. So when he says they were cast down into hell, listen, interesting, the Greek word translated here for hell is is Tartarus, literally Tartarus, and it's, a, it's, it's found in Greek mythology. Tartarus was the lowest hell, or the deepest hell, a place of punishment for the rebellious gods of Greek mythology. It's only used one time in Scripture, and Peter robs it from, this, from the Greek mythology, the whole idea. He says they were cast into the deepest of the deepest of the deepest of pits. Anyways. as an example, okay? But he did not spare the ancient world. Speaking of Noah, Genesis 6, we have the corruption of humanity in the days of Noah, Genesis 7. God judges the ancient world with the flood because you see, the, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, is what 6.5 says in Genesis. Therefore, this event is a warning to the world. Now, I want you to read, listen to me clearly, because I don't want you to repeat this in a, and say it's heresy and repeat it wrong. Okay? The rainbow is not a symbol of the removal of judgment. And a lot of times we look at it that way. No, he just simply said, I'm not going to judge the world in the same fashion. Right? But even in the end times, even in the book of Revelation, during the seven-year tribulation period, it says the oceans, the seas will be removed from themselves. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to cover the whole earth with a flood, but there's still going to be some aqua, some serious aqua judgment happening, right? But that rainbow, that rainbow is a picture of the gospel. Listen closely. That there is only one way to escape judgment and that is to place your faith and trust in the one who can save. So the rainbow is not the removal of judgment, but it screams that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that, 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 that there you can escape that judgment through a relationship with the God who created you. Now, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Busted into ashes, he condemned them to destruction. God judged these cities, making them an example as well. Listen, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah was great, and because their sin was grave. Boy, I tell you, if you're going to be made mentioned in the Bible, I don't want to be made uh, here uh, you know, as someone who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah during these days, or, or even in the days of Noah. I want to read... 
John 16 to you, 8 through 11 on the screen. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because, you see, I go to my Father and you see him no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. We've got to place our faith in Jesus. 7 through 9. And delivered righteous lot. We're still in Sodom and Gomorrah right here as an example, but now he moves and making Lot an example. He delivered righteous Lot. Now you might think, Lot, how was he righteous? I mean, I'm thinking this guy was making nothing but bad, unbiblical choices, right? To associate with people that were heretical in their lifestyle, right? They were living an untrue lifestyle, a lifestyle that misrepresented the creator God. And yet, he was a believer in the God who created all things. So this guy's life was in conflict. This is what Peter is saying. When you choose to go as a believer and run with the world, you're going to be in conflict. He was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, even though he was a righteous man, because he dwelt among them. This meant torture for his own soul from day to day, just because he was running and participating and be, hearing their lawless deeds. As a Christian, you, you go to work and someone wants to show you something nasty on their phone. Right? Or, they, or they want to tell a dirty joke. When I was in business, some of the guys that I would do work for, a self-employed, but a, I'd be on a construction site, and they know I was a Christian. So sometimes they thought it was funny to pull something nasty on their phone and call me over and trick me. Hey, you know, and I'm like, man, not even cool. You know, don't even, don't even go there. That was super offensive, right? Again, you're tricking me, and, and, and not, not cool. You got to be careful. We got to guard against these things. Peter already told us how the Lord had delivered Noah. Now, righteous Lot is delivered. But he was righteous in God's eyes. God is righteous, and that righteousness is imputed to us. That's important to understand positionally where you are with God. You've got to understand these things. But I want to say this sin is not healthy. It will have an effect on you spiritually. It will have an effect on you relationally. It will have an effect on you emotionally. And it will have an effect even physically on you. But listen, but greater yet, sin will affect you eternally if you're not careful. Remember, Jesus forgives sin. And one of the greatest statements is that the, this, the, the Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly, or excuse me, the godly out of temptation. He knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Now in closing, these last two verses are very special in calling out a false teacher. He says, and especially those who walk according to the flesh. They're marked by those who walk according to the flesh. That means their own desires, their own lusts. It's marked by uncleanliness, means ungodliness, right? And they despise authority. There it is again. No willingness to submit. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels, and he's talking about righteous angels, right? Good angels. Who are greater in power and might, they do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord, not even them. Now, this is very interesting. The ungodly ones, they're especially reserved for judgment. They will live according to the flesh and not the spirit, and they're marked by these things. You'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. <laughs> you ever have a hard, I, I, I had a hard time finding fake fruit. When I was a kid, you, you could find fake fruit. Everybody had fake fruit on their table, right? 
You ever pick up a big old apple and you think, wow. Now we had to go buy some little kid's kitchen set for like gobs of money and just to steal this one thing out. You know? And then you got this little tangerine, this little cutie, and these things are so good. You can eat these things all day long, right? Till your stomach gets sick. They're so delicious. They're so sweet. This thing right here is just nasty, right? What a big difference. Right? It, it's just, it's fake. You see, especially those who walk, you can mark them. Jesus said in Matthew, you'll know them by their fruit. And in essence, Peter's closing out this, this statement here with the same idea. You'll know them. How? They're marked. They walk according to the flesh. Lust, uncleanliness. Listen, they despise authority. They're presumptuous. They're self-willed. They speak evil of dignitaries. These are the fruits of unevil people or un ungodly people, evil people. Whereas the angels, they're greater in power. This brought me, and remember I told you when we started First Peter that Jude was like literally, you know, I think Second Peter was written first, and then Jude had gotten a hold of it because there's just there's so much similar stuff mentioned. But turn with me to Jude. Now it's easy because there's there's only one chapter, right? So when I say chapter one, it's not like I don't know that there's no more chapters than that. Right? So Jude 1, right? Jude, uh, uh, picking up in verse 5. Uh, similar stuff, but, but listen how this thing kind of ends out. He says, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, <laughs> you, you have forgotten this truth. You once knew it. That the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt... Afterward, he destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their abode, their own abode, or kept their own proper domain, but left their abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Verse 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to those having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Verse 8, likewise, also those dreamers, right? those false teachers, defile the flesh. They reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. And, and, and talking about the angels here, in the very last statement, he says, where the angels who are greater in power and might did not bring reviling accusation. Listen, nine, and yet Michael, right? He's some kind of high chief ranking, high ranking angel. Even Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring an accusation against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Th this is powerful, powerful stuff. You see, Michael was, a, was the, is, is marked as the real deal. And here he is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan himself over the body of the prophet Moses. He's contending with him. And, and instead of bringing accusations, and he, could, he was there from the beginning, he could, have, he could have been reminding Satan of all this stuff. But he says, the Lord rebuke you. The power is in the Lord. The power is in the word of God. You see, Michael didn't take it upon himself to be something he's not. I'm Michael the archangel. The Lord rebuke you. You know? And, and, and people, men, false prophets, false teachers, they get carried away with rebuking everything, causing, bringing accusation against everything and everybody, but not Michael. You see, he, his real faith, his real trust, his real strength was in the Lord and the power of God. You know, right, wrong, or indifferent, a righteous person or a godly pastor, we are going to stand on the word of God 
Our faith is in the power of God and in the testimony of what's been spoken. I don't need any more. I just need this. I need to learn. I need to grow in this. I need to proclaim this. I don't need to proclaim anything else, and neither do you. Everything you need for life and godly living is right here. Enter in. Press in. Absorb this, and you won't be carried away, and neither will I. This is important stuff. He says, I need to warn you about these things, or you will be carried away by those, their sheep's and wolf's clothing. And they, they come in. And, and I'll tell you, the, one of the greatest things about a church, and, and I'll tell you, the most dangerous thing you can do is, is, is go somewhere and plant a little church. Oh, God, it's so scary. You got people coming in. You, you haven't, you're not established. You don't have any solid biblical leaders. And so all kinds of crazy people migrate in, thinking they can use the pulpit to say all kinds of stupid stuff. When I planted a little church in Tennessee, I'd have guys, big old medallions, cards, reverend, the great so-and-so, and they'd come one Sunday, and they'd tell, you know I preach, I'd like to preach from your pulpit. I'd say, get out of here. I don't even know you, dude. You look like a quackpot anyway. You know, coming in here with your card, and all your big gold chains, and whatever. You know, a lot of times they'd ride in in a, on a you know, $30,000 Harley, true story, or a big old Corvette, or a big shiny Mercedes. You're just trying to fleece my flock, Joker. Get down down the road. But man, they come in, and it's hard to fight against that stuff because you, you don't have any, you know, it's just you, man. It's like you're just always, the, 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 the pastor's planting church. You literally, you always got your fists up. You're always, you know, because the enemy's always, you're always punching somebody in the mouth. You know, it's hard, but, but it's so good when you've got good, solid, biblical, mature leaders and elders in the church. So I don't have to be the bad guy all the time. I don't have to be the one saying, hey, you know, wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I just say, sick him, Doug. Sick him, Steve. Sick him, Rich. It's good stuff, man. You should go to a church like that. That's the safest place to be. You know, everybody's in unity. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for everyone being patient. It was long, Lord. Uh, we ask, Lord, that, that you would strengthen us, that your Holy Spirit would guide us, God, and hold us and keep us in all truth, Lord. We love you. We want you and we want all that you have for us, Lord. Help us to, to stand fast as that day approaches. In Jesus' name, amen.